Let me now turn to uh, Norman Stone um, uh, and invite him to speak to us. Uh, Professor, uh, this um, conference is put on by, among others, the Friends of Hungary. And Norman Stone can reasonably be described as a friend of Hungary, having come here first in 1962 as an undergraduate to learn Hungary and also to pick up all kinds of other interesting bits of information, such as the different different intricacies of the theology, different theologies of different of, of Hungarian Protestantism, uh, and and I think if you read any of Norman's histories, which are very uh, easy and charming to read. Um, they, the, the wisdom in them is full of interesting, odd, side, sideways and byways um, of, of historical development, um, wonderful anecdotes, things that make you realize that history is about people and not simply about trends. And that's one of the major themes of Peter Bauer's writing. So I can do no better than to hand over to Norman to talk on the uh, ideological or um, background or intellectual background of thought that um, Peter gained from being part of the Austria-Hungary world of economics. I've been, um, uh, I've, I've been told to keep my remarks strictly to half an hour. Um, uh, it's not going to be. Uh, I have three very difficult acts to follow. These were, um, I must say, uh, stunning contributions. I'm very glad to have heard them all. Um, now, uh, I'm going to be purely descriptive. Um, I knew Peter Bauer when I was a young fellow at, uh, at, uh, in Cambridge, and um, we got on well because we had Hungary in common, and I'll say some more about that. But I think the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, if you get interested in the Brexit question, there's an absolutely excellent book by Roger Bootle. Uh, it's very fair. Um, he's a Brexiteer in the end, but with some you know, finger-chewing. And he says in it, uh, talking about England, I'm a Scotsman, but I allow myself to say England. I mean, you know, I mean, we all we all call the Netherlands Holland, and I can't be bothered with this kind of thing. Um, he he says, yes, our music's nothing to compare with the Germans. Our painting, you can't compare it with the Italians. Literature, the French probably have the edge, but one thing we are very good at: political economy. And that's about right. Um, the uh, Cambridge that I was in was really a very, very good place to uh, to learn something about the technicalities of uh, eco economics, which I did through history. Um, it, when Peter Bauer arrived there, it must have been surreal. You know, you came to these majestic buildings, uh, and the head porter would be a majestic figure in a top hat whom everybody assumed was the master of the place. The, the porters used to come round the undergraduates' rooms and clean their shoes in the morning. Uh, you, we were locked in after 12. Uh, there were surreal episodes of, of um, sex, sexual misdeeds, um, <laughs> but not that many, and it, uh, the place worked really remarkably well. I went there as a scholarship boy from Glasgow in December 1958 and remember it very, very well indeed with a lot of fondness. Now, uh, that'll be the Cambridge that Peter Bauer encountered. And I can't imagine how on earth speaking Hungarian English, and you know, can I do it? A lorry drive there, this kind of thing. Um, how on earth he talked his way in. Uh, he must have done it, presumably he, he uh, communicated in German. I, I'm, uh, but still, what a good place to spot his talent and take him in. Um, 
uh, uh, um, he, um, there were other Hungarian economists, and I just quite superficially looked up the background. Uh, Peter Bauer told me this, that his father was indeed a bookmaker. Yes. Um, and he wanted to get his son into the Piorista Gymnasium, the Piorist School, which is very grand Catholic. And the chairman of governors was a Count Shigroy, who I think was the mayor of Budapest at the time, uh, with a palace on Vatsyutsa. Uh, and Peter Bauer, Jewish, uh, his father, said he would um, cancel the Count's racing debts if... So, so, so Peter Bauer got into the Piorista Gymnasium. I looked up Bolog and Kaldor. Um, they were at the Trefort School, the Minta Gymnasium, the teacher's training place, where they presumably picked up secularism and socialism. Um, Peter Bauer, already rather different. Uh, now, um, uh, my title is a bit odd, uh, uh, Aust Austrian-Hungarian economics. Um, I wonder what the influence on a dissident economist like Peter Bauer was from people like the Mises School in Austria. I mean, this, this, is, a, it's, this is something I am speculating, but I imagine that in Budapest at the time, the, um, uh, a lot of the serious economics would have been done on, on the Viennese model. And that was a pretty serious one. I mean, too serious. Uh, one thing can be said, the Central European School of Economists, with the exception of Dr. Akos Bod, lacks charm. <laughs> and, uh, and these dogmatic Viennese, Menger, there was a man called Böhm Bavirk, now forgotten, who wrote a thing this size, disproving Marx in 1904, 13 years before the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, but it's still a very serious, serious uh, school of economics, and it is designed, I think, essentially, to stop, uh, to stop democracy from uh, taking over governments and ruining economies. It is worth noting, I think, that uh, economics in Anglo-Saxon countries, quite successful because you can somehow combine it with democracy. The Democrats don't necessarily steal. They try to. But if you're, if you're a serious German-Austrian economist and God knows they were talented. Uh, you're always thinking, how do we stop the Czechs or the Hungarians or the Christian Democrats uh, from, well, from stealing, from levying high taxes on the local Jews? Somebody said about Christian socialism that Christian means anti-Semitic and socialism means stealing. And uh, <laughs> now... I submit that this is the background to that Mises school of trying to uh, set up hard and fast rules. And it also applied in Germany. Um, we can maybe go on on this subject a bit later. Um, uh, now, the, the problem with, um, uh, with uh, Austria-Hungary was that it is, I suppose, the first case in European history since, well, maybe since the Counter-Reformation. But it's the first instance in history where the problem that Professor Akos Bod was talking about, of a top-heavy state, really comes up in a big way. Um, in England, uh, uh, in, in England, local government, for instance, was represented by a very efficient town hall, um, a, a bullying mayor with a secretary, and a local council of people who got things done, those Victorian cities. 
Um, in Austria-Hungary, I suppose since Joseph II, uh, there was always the tendency to look to the state for an answer. And the result was that in 1914, 25% of the employed population in Austria-Hungary, uh, maybe just Austria, was employed by the state, railways, hospitals, a big civil service. Here's one example. Um, you know how difficult it is to deal with nationality problems. I mean, my own instinct about it is decentralize, keep government out of it. Like October Diploma, 1860, is the answer to these things. But the Austrians built up volumes of uh, nationality laws. Can you speak Czech? Can you use a Czech policeman in the bottom left-hand corner of the market on a Friday afternoon in Budjevitz's stroke Budweis? Uh, this kind of nonsense, which the Europeans nowadays are very good at. Um, and uh, the result was the, the employment of uh, enormous numbers of lawyers for a start. And lawyers, I mean, I don't want to be offensive, obviously, um, do tend to make people hate each other. <laughs> and, uh, now, there were in the Supreme Court of the Kingdom of Bohemia in Prague, 7,000 judges in the, Supreme, in the court, in, in the Bohemian system. And the judges in the entire British Empire amounted to 1,700. Now, this means that the economic background of somebody like Peter Bauer, I'm speculating, is influenced by this, this fear of the predatory state, which you can't in the end get rid of. I mean, in the end, the Austrians did so badly in the First World War because they were spending money on all this kind of thing. And their 48 divisions in 1914 um, got rather less money than the six divisions of the British Army in 1914. Um, these people were dealing with a serious problem, in other words. Now, uh, and I think their descendants come up with, um, well, with the Germans in 1947, Rupke, Müller, Harmack. Again, people of charmless work, of charmless worthiness, but who nevertheless managed to make a hugely successful economy. I mean, for a long time in England, uh, uh, you know, we rather cringed when we looked at uh, the way Germany functioned. Things were different in the 80s. Now, when Peter Bauer comes up to Cambridge, he's dealing with uh, the siren song of uh, John Maynard Keynes. And now, I think, um, you know, I really don't want to encourage my enemies too much, but um, we ought to remember the circumstances of the 1930s. Um, no one has talked too much about the slump, but what a devastating business that was. It's, uh, was it... Um, 25% unemployment in the United States. We know about the 8 million in Germany and its consequences. World exports went down by two thirds. Uh, it's, a, it was a, it, it's, it's not a very good argument for capitalism. And if serious people like Keynes, John Kenneth Galbraith, say, how do we avoid this? I think we have to have a certain understanding for them. Um, that would be for the 1930s. And I think it is true that in the 1930s, people like Hayek or Lionel Robbins, the Mont Pelerin people, uh, they were very much on the defensive. Uh, this would be true, well, pretty well in, in all countries. The state just had to step in, didn't it? to try to absorb something. I think the problem with the Keynesians comes up a bit later. Now, the war, Second World War I. 
people like Hayek, uh, Peter Bauer, I think another genius at the LSE, Ili Kaduri, very much question the Keynesian triumph. Uh, but they are a minority. The inter the, uh, as A.J.B. Taylor said, they are like Jacobites at the, at the exiled court of the Stuarts in, in, uh, in, uh, in Saint-Germain in 1700. And people don't take them seriously. And it, uh, somebody like Peter Bauer stands out with his questioning of the whole thing as rather a lonely voice. He was, by the way, an immensely charming chap. And um, I'm not quite sure how much it was, but he was, he was really quite seriously rich. And you know how he did it? He betted on horses. <laughs> <laughs> Professors in England are not paid very well. And he teamed up with the senior classicist of uh, his college, Gondolin Keyes. Um, and uh, they were very good at spotting pedigrees of horses and uh, rode, around, uh, rode around Cambridge in a Bentley. Um, he lived well, did Peter Bauer. And uh, <coughs> um, then he um, went to the LSE. And it's, uh, the LSE became um, it really rather surprising given that its origins are in Fabian socialism, um, it produced these uh, very considerable figures, Hayek, not just, not just Hayek and, uh, and um, Peter Bauer, but Eli Kaduri, I have a lot of admiration for, writing about nationalism in the Middle East and much else. It was a very good place was the LSE, and incidentally, uh, you know, if any of you are thinking of graduate studies in England, the rule is go to the LSE. Oxford and Cambridge maltreat their graduate students and always have done. Um, they, uh, <laughs> one thing I will say about, about him, I've had such uh, admiration for the LSE that um, in one of uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, explosive moments, she abolished the Greater London Council. Um, you know, she thought of them just as a bunch of reds. And uh, it occupied a, a huge building in the, middle, in the middle of the Thames in an island. And I had prepared an article saying, look, rather than give it, you know, the, the unfortunate side of the Thatcher business was that it could possibly have been, <laughs> sorry, turned into a Japanese love hotel. Um, <laughs> I said, rather than this, shall we give it to the LSE as a reward for initiative? And Peter looked at me and said, would you give English social sciences any, any, any building like that at the present time? I'm afraid I rather took his point. Now, um, how am I off for time, John? Have I? Oh, good, good, good. Um, I was going to talk about what happened in the, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, there was a very sudden change in the early 60s in, uh, in Cambridge, in the way Cambridge worked. The undergraduates petitioned for the porters not to clean their shoes. Um, and that was the beginning of something. It was 1961 or 62. And all sorts of things then began to go of the old ritual ways. And uh, the Cambridge economics took a very strange turn. I think, frankly, they'd got it in their heads that the Keynesians had the answer to everything. And you could say, and I'm glad... I'm, 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 I'm glad Dr. Akos Bord brought it up. You could say the Marshall Plan was uh, you know, the best possible example of, well, if you like, public spending in action, government-to-government -government aid. Um, 
the, uh, uh, there are many, many questions about this. I mean, I've, I've followed the accounts of the Marshall Plan, and uh, I mean, it obviously kept body and soul together in 1947. There was a terrible winter in 47, followed by a drought in the summer. And that had devastating effects on Germany and Central Europe particularly. I mean, some of you will remember what your parents said about the winter of 46, 47 in Hungary. It was a devastating time. And uh, Marshall presenting food to the starving Europeans was obviously very important. But, you know, if you look at the books of Hogan, which is the one I know best, um, you really wonder, wasn't Europe recovering anyway? Um, uh, France, Germany, in their way, uh, uh, recovering anyway. And with the introduction of GATT, and uh, trade with America, then the Europeans might well have recovered. Now, uh, there's one, uh, and then they used it in rather peculiar ways. The British used it essentially to keep up the value of sterling. And I must at this point <laughs> boast that I come from a heroic country, a heroic country. You know what we spent at 90% of dollar earnings on in 1947-49, cigarettes. <laughs> I got that from Edmund Dell, you know, the life of the chancellors. Now, uh, the Marshall Plan seemed to be, the, give the model for how to treat stricken countries. And these can-do Americans and can-do Germans are coming in, well, Miracles happen. In 1951, German exports overtook British exports and compare the state of Germany in 45 with England. It was extraordinary. And so it went on. Now there is a sea change at the beginning of the 60s when a, a conservative government in England and Kennedy in America and even late Adenauer in Germany, start thinking, oh, we can have deficits. We'll spend government money, which just uh, on credit. And it's the beginning of a debauching of the currency, which led to the troubles of the 1970s um, and the disillusionment of the whole system. The Cambridge Economics Faculty, uh, with almost no exception, went along with this. Now you think, what exactly is the West's problem in 1962 that it needs to go in for inflationary currency and to invoke the name Keynes? What is the problem? There was no unemployment. Poverty was going. Uh, I was reading a very interesting Italian book, uh, Indra Montanelli, who points out just how limited the view, even of very considerable economists, was that the, even Ainaudi, again, Montpellier, an immensely serious man, couldn't see that in the foreseeable future, the proletariat would more or less disappear and be replaced by small family firms, as in Italy, working hand over fist. No one foresaw this. Um, and uh, quite why the economists in the 60s should have gone hook, line and sinker for uh, Keynesian deficit spending. It did, uh, it did considerable damage, I, I, I think we'd all agree, to the British economy. And it, uh, people like uh, Nicky Caldor, you know, with his slide rules and his plans and his taxes, uh, rose. And the British economy began to lag very badly. Uh, I, now, the Cambridge economics at the time, having been superb in the 1930s, I think, uh, you mentioned John Robinson, I think. 
John Robinson, who had been Keynes's brightest, uh, brightest pupil, um, she was the daughter of, uh, of, of a, a fire-eating reactionary general who had tried to get rid of Lloyd George. And he was the son of a major Victorian romantic poet, England again. Now, Joan Robinson was married to uh, Austin Robinson. Again, rather fashionable, gains in. And she looked at China, bless her, China. Now, China had just killed off 30 million people with the great leap forward. People were eating the bark off trees. Then, it, then came the Cultural Revolution. And Joan Robinson used to say, we must look at the Chinese model. <laughs> and she used to pad around King's College, Cambridge, in a Mao, in a Mao tracksuit. <laughs> and she was followed by quite a number of the senior people in that particular economics faculty. I remember teaching an army officer around that time who had gone to some of the economics lectures and he, uh, I said, how do you find the lectures? And he said, the, the economists smell. <laughs> and so it was. Cambridge economics never quite, as I haven't followed it too closely but has lost its reputation to places like, I suppose, Chicago. Um, uh, no, I think um, it, uh, yes, two final points. Uh, it, it took the 1970s to change things. As 19, the 1970s went ahead, the record in terms of inflation of things not working, all the things we were most proud of, say the National Health Service, not working, deficits, the economic remedies not working. And then from the middle 70s onwards, up comes a, a group of people like Peter Bauer to say, your emperor not only has no clothes, he hasn't got a tailor. And uh, uh, they were rather heroic people at the time. It, it, you know, universally conspué, as the French say, um, in polite circles. But still, events were moving their way, and eventually it produced Margaret Thatcher, which was you know, a very remarkable thing. I thought, I have to say, that that would be the last moment when uh, an English woman dominated the world stage. And then along came Princess Diana. <laughs> um, uh, things gone right, things gone wrong in England. Um, uh, but still, it turned a corner in the 80s and that was worth doing. Um, uh, the other little tribute that I could make to Peter Bauer now, is that uh, um, I lived in Turkey for 20 years. And uh, when I first went there, it, was, it had opened up. Özal had opened it up in the 80s. But it was a sclerotic state-run place. You were arrested at the airport if you had a packet of those. <laughs> Not for health reasons, but because uh, they were protecting their own rather remarkable cigarettes. And uh, the cats uh, had played a role in rubbish collection, and even in Ankara, in that people would leave their rubbish in bags. The cats would scratch them open. And uh, uh, then somehow, in the last 20 years, I've seen that country, well, we can call it take-off if you like. It's now exporting hand over fist with all the troubles of the present government. Something has worked from that kind of Peter Bauer uh, recipe. Peace to his soul. Thank you. Yes, fine. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> no.
No, no, and that was sparkling. Uh, prompts two thoughts. Uh, one is that it wasn't only the Cambridge economics faculty that lost its mind in the ways you described in the 1960s, but it was the Conservative government, actually, who did all of the things, uh, acted on the advice that were given, and, and didn't produce the best results. In fact, they produced a continuation of the crisis that eventually produced Thatcher. The other is um, your story about Peter making uh, money through betting on the races. Well, there must have been something in the air of the Cambridge, economic, uh, the Cambridge um, uh, colleges and faculty in general, because a friend of mutual friend of ours, the late Frank Johnson, he um, who left school at fifteen but always wanted to read classics at university, went out to buy what he thought would be a serious and important book on um, the classics because it was by the distinguished philosopher. Um, from Cambridge and then later at LSE, whose name is just suddenly, uh, sorry? No, no, the, um, oh gosh, the philosopher who was the, uh, who was the inspiration for Ken Minogue and Shelley Letwin. Oakeshott, Michael Oakeshott. He went out to buy uh, and bought um, uh, Michael Oakeshott's Guide to the Classics, which turned out to be a guide to all the famous classic races in England. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so obviously there was a, a there was a school of of, um, of uh, racing experts in Cambridge at the same time. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for that uh, that um, that talk, which gave which brought Peter alive f for me and for others who knew him. I think, and also, of course, had a lot of fascinating points to make about our current situation.